Everybody ready? I call this meeting of the Lakota Board of Education, Monday, January 24th, 2022 to order. Thank you all mm -hmm. for joining us this evening. Uh, Mrs. Logan is with us by Zoom and will be still participating as our uh, board secretary. Mrs. Logan, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Adi? Here. Mrs. Bodie? Here. Mrs. Casper? Here. Mrs. O'Connor? Here. Mrs. Schaefer is also participating by Zoom. She'll be able to participate in our discussion, but she will not be voting tonight. Mrs. Logan, would you like to include her? Yes. Mrs. Schaefer? Uh, present via Zoom. <laughs> Thank you all. Stick with us as we use a slightly different format tonight to make sure that everyone is included. Mr. Adi, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Can we be upstanding, please? To the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. We will have, because it's a work session agenda, we will have a slightly different format for our public comment so that everyone is aware it'll be a little bit later in the meeting. And it will be for 45 minutes. And again, speakers are asked to stick to three minutes for whatever they'd like to share with the board. If you would like to not share your address, you're welcome to bring that forward to Mr. Miller when you come forward to speak. Otherwise, please state your name and address when you come up to speak. There is a sign-in sheet at the back of the room if you'd please take care of that now. Mm -hmm. We will move to a motion to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion? Madam President. I would like to make a motion to add to the agenda a resolution that is extremely important. Would you like to share that resolution with the board? Yes. Madam President, I have submitted and have in front of me a massive amount of data and more than 150 comparative studies and articles on mask and, and effectiveness and analyze that not only calls into question how the COVID-19 response has been handled at Lakota, but clearly demonstrates and makes the case of why it needs to end. I would like to make a motion on this day, January 24th, to vote on a resolution that will end all protocols that the Lakota School District is currently following regarding COVID-19 and return to the health and safety policies that were in effect on March 1st, 2020. This resolution is needed because the protocols that Lakota School District is currently following regarding COVID-19 are not only dubious and enigmatic regarding our effective, their effectiveness as treatments or protections, but are damaging to the health of all who are affected by these protocols, including but not limited, limited to our children, our faculty, and our administrators. The information supporting the assertions and conclusions of this resolution have either been previously submitted to this board or were available to the board members as to be appropriately apprised of the content. This information makes clear the rationale for this motion and the adoption of the resolution. Is there more to your resolution that you submitted earlier? Do you want to read the entire resolution? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, resolution to end all protocols in the Lakota School District is currently following regarding COVID-19 and return to the health and safety policies that were in effect on March 1st, 2020. Whereas Health Department under the Ohio Revised Code 3707.8, 3707.11, 3707.16, and 707.34 are authorized to declare quarantinable disease, identify individuals that may have a quarantinable disease, and take actions that such departments deem necessary to conduct quarantines, including identifying and labeling the places where such quarantines will take place. Whereas health departments have the authority to conditionally assign this authority to their commissioner, Whereas if the health department sees fit to isolate or quarantine an individual, the health department appears to have the authority, the resources, and can absorb any associated liabilities. Whereas no such authority or obligation regarding quarantines are 
or requiring the use of masks is extended by law to the Lakota School Board or its administrators, whereas the Ohio Department of Health has chosen to use guidelines regarding COVID-19, a move that affords individuals and organizations the opportunity to use, utilize all available information to formulate policy, whereas the health risks of wearing masks, taking vaccinations, and being subjected to the kind of isolation that comes with being locked down or quarantined is documented in such a comprehensive manner and by such distinguished and credible individuals and institutions as to not be ignored but taken very seriously. Whereas at the very least, there is substantive and substantiated doubt as to the effectiveness of masks, vaccines, and quarantines in the absence of symptoms, but overwhelming and incontrovertible evidence of the serious health risks or negative consequences of their use or implementation. Whereas a credible source, whereas credible sources show that overall death count caused by COVID-19 has been overstated, whereas it is undisputed that children not only have a minute risk of serious illness to COVID-19 or its variants, but as well, but as well pose virtually no threat to themselves or adults as spreaders of the virus, whereas overwhelming data, data and evidence demonstrating that the current variants of COVID-19 are even less threatening, whereas the Lakota School District is not required or authorized or properly suited to either force masks, vaccinations, or implement or even suggest quarantines based on a test or postulate that Lakota School Board or its administrators know best who should or should not be vaccinated, whereas it is not in the best interest of the school to take part in experiments that include forced or required masking, vaccine shaming, i.e. Track, tracking medical choices of students, faculty, or and or administrators and suggesting or requiring, whereas or requiring certain actions to be taken, whereas natural immunity is evidence to be superior to the vaccine vaccinations against COVID variants, whereas the United Kingdom has ended mandatory masking and COVID-19 passports, citing the diminished threat, stating that we must learn to live with COVID in the same way we live with the flu, whereas the Lakota School District, through its administration, has been implementing COVID-19 guidelines suggested by the health authorities, and whereas a responsible consideration of this information dictates that the Lakota School Board, the Lakota School District remove itself from these COVID-19 related protocols, be it resolved that the Lakota School Board recognize that a responsible consideration of this information and supporting documentation contained in this resolution and provided in support of this resolution dictates that the Lakota School District remove itself from all these from these and all COVID-19 related protocols and vote to effective immediately return to Lakota schools health and safety policies as they were March 1st, 2020. I have a motion on the floor to amend the agenda to include the resolution as it was just stated by Mrs. Darby. I will second that motion for the purposes of discussion. So the motion on the floor is to add this resolution to the agenda. Board, your feedback. And I'll start with Mrs. Schaefer as we occasionally have difficulties with technology. I wanna make sure that she does have an opportunity to weigh in just in case there's any trouble with hearing her. Mrs. Schaefer, was there anything you'd like to add? Um, I think first of all, I don't feel that we need to vote on this resolution. We didn't receive this resolution ahead of time. We've also received legal advice that this is not advisable. So I do not feel the need to add this resolution at this time. Thank you, Julie. This is Casper. Uh, I will have to agree. I This is the first we've heard or seen it. Um, so I don't really think that it should be voted on at this meeting. I also think we just got a legal opinion on this very thing today from Mr. Miller and our attorney board. It was from our attorney. I, we don't, I don't feel like we know more than the legal professional or the medical community. So in my opinion, we do not, I, I would not support this motion. Thanks, Kelly. Mr. Andy. I love the motion. Um, I love it because I also believe that mask, uh, in my personal opinion, does not help anybody. 
Um, and I, th I thought we, we moved, this motion was moved. If I'm wrong, please correct me. We moved this motion, I seconded for this motion to, to be presented February 4th or something like that. Am I missing something? There was a motion, there was a motion on mask policy, right? Yes, for the for the policy. We don't currently have a mask policy committee. We do actually have a mask policy. Um, it is 8450 to protect facial coverings during pandemics. We do have a policy, but there was a discussion by the board. I'm sorry yes. to interrupt you. Go ahead. There was a discussion by the board to move this issue to the policy committee to address it there. Yes, that's that's yeah, that's, that's what I'm trying to. Yeah, I'm trying to. <laughs> yeah, that's let it come. So um, the motion you read, I love it, but I think there are a lot of information in that motion that we need to really dig into it to make sure we do justice to it, to be able to ensure we're not, that's not liability or anything of sort like that on the motion. So in as much as I love that motion, I will think that we need to work on it first before we vote on it. I apologize. We do. I'm not. We don't have a mask mandate, is what I meant. I knew we had a mask. Right. We don't have a mask exactly. mandate. Okay. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> but was there anything else, Mr. D? No, that's it. I would say to the mask mandate, we do have one with quarantine, and there are no medical exemptions with the quarantine. So therefore, those who are medically not able to wear a mask, we are still making them wear a mask. However, that is not what I'm debating. What I'm debating is that with within all of this data that we. The parents have been speaking um, for the past two years, bringing up their concerns and the news. I don't understand why you guys are not prepared for this motion. If you don't agree, that's fine. You don't have to make, you don't have to agree. But I think within the past two years, you guys have been informed of all of the uh, harm potentially causing our students. And that's, and as far as the legal aspect, I'm more concerned with the, with the parents who's um, who we are making and suggesting this medical device that is potentially harmful, I'm afraid of those lawsuits. And, and, and if it comes down to the law, if it comes down to the insurance company, well, there are 30 other um, schools in the, in the state that are doing exactly what I'm trying to implement. So we can just go to their insurance company and, and forget about ours. I, I don't think that it has to... Yes, there's been over the last two years, a lot of medical data that have been presented by parents. There's also been as much medical data on the other side. So it's a case of not just because, again, just because we don't agree doesn't mean we haven't listened. I think that's yeah. an important part. There's, there's, I believe that as we can see from past board meetings, there is as much information on this end as there is on this end. So I think that I'm just not comfortable Mr. potentially harming the speaker. I, I, I completely understand. I believe you and I on this on the same uh, spot as regards these issues. If the, the the motion was straightforward, as in against mass mandate, I'm going for it. But I know there are a lot of things you read there that I have, not, I have not seen, I have not read it. And I don't know how, how much facts are in there, whether there are uh, uh, um, issues that we need to clear deep in, maybe check with our attorney and get it well before we vote on. I will go for it because I believe you and I, we're on the same sp uh, spot as regards that issue. Mrs. Bunny, you had something else? Yes. So my concern is, um, you know, as a board member, we are, um, you know, our job is to improve, improve classroom and school climate and culture and protect our students and staff from harm. And with data, how are we protecting our students from harm when this potential, this data is potentially saying that the masks um, are extremely har harmful to our students. An example, um, let's see, doctor suspended from Houston um, Methodist 
for backing in ivermectin and opposing vaccine mandates, Seuss Hospital. <clears throat> um, I see, COVID-19 will become just another cause of common cold, UK professor. Um, states investigating a surge in mortality rate among 18 to 48, 49 year olds, majority unrelated to COVID-19. Exclusive nationwide surge in deaths among 18 to 49, a state by state overview. Why did US deaths shoot up 40% above normal last year? Not related to COVID. Doctors gather at summit to warn against vaccinating children. Fully vaccinated Australians in a hospital for COVID-19 surpass unvaccinated. Dr. Peter Mercola, healthy children do not need to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Think twice before you vaccinate your kids. Dr. Robert Malone warns parents on COVID-19. Israel, one of the most vaccinated countries in the world, sets new COVID-19 record cases. 10 reasons why children and young people should not get the COVID vaccine. Natural immunity superior to this is dirty. May I interrupt you? Against were, they, virus. were these included on the emails that you sent? They were. Okay. And these I, are all. I think we will take it appearance. as a given that you've submitted that to us. You don't need to read more titles. Well, I was also letting the, the community know. Um, but there are um, also parents and teachers that have been discussing this for the past two years. So this is not new information. And absolutely. Let's one at a time, please, yeah. Mr. D. Uh, Debbie, what I'm saying is, I did not, I support, if you bring a motion, I believe that probably you and I are going to agree on a lot of things. I never saw any of those documents. And all through the week, if we had, we're a team, I believe all of us want to do the same thing. All of us want the school system to, to all support our students. I believe that if you had presented this at the right time and we all have access to the documents and look at it, I believe it's gonna be different. I want you to understand that I, be, I support your motion, but the way you present it right, I'm, I'm just hearing this for the first time. You're hearing what? This they, COVID they, data for the first time? It was emailed this afternoon. I saw it this afternoon. I didn't get time, to, I've been busy, been working. Right. So I couldn't get time to look at it. I love the motion. I would love to support the motion, but I would love to look through everything and make sure we're all on the same page and everything there is factual and we can defend it. So with that being said, just a moment, Mrs. Casper. I, I think we can find as much information as I said before on the opposite side of that. Everything that you've just read, I'm sure that I can find a counter <coughs> article that says the opposite. I, I think that's what we've been saying for right. I agree. Go ahead. Um, my concern is that we are potentially hurting our students even more. And I believe that it should be up to the parents and they should be able to make the decision on what is best for their children. For us to tell them that they need to quarantine, that is not our responsibility. That is not um, Matt Miller's responsibility. That is actually the board of the Department of Health's responsibility to say someone needs to be quarantined. Now they can come in here and they can specifically say to each and every child, you need to be quarantined. But that is not our responsibility. It is the parents' responsibility. And who are we to say what is right and what is wrong? And with this, this makes me uncomfortable. This is potentially a lawsuit coming from parents on the other side as well. So we need to decide you know, what is more, I just, we need to decide, are we okay with damaging our, our children? Is there anything further, Mrs. Bodie? I, I, I want to say something. Is there anything further? No. Mr. Reddy? Yes, if that was your motion, I, I would second for you. What I'm saying is, you have a lot of documents right now that you presented. I'm just seeing that document. I'm just hearing about it for the first time. I know email, I saw your email. But since we have not gone through all that, it's a resolution that you're, you're, you're bringing right now. I don't, I want to support it. I love, I would love to support it. I would love to support it if you can give me time. Anything else, Mr. D? Oh, Mrs. Casper and Mrs. Schaefer? No. I, Mrs. Schaefer. I would also like to add, I looked through my emails and I don't see where I've received an email at all on this information. And you're talking about protecting kids by removing this mandate, I could say I'm home today because perhaps we haven't protected our kids as well as we should have with a mask mandate because 
I'm fairly certain my son, given that it went through his entire friend group at school, got COVID at school, passed it on to me. Thank goodness I'm not immune compromised, so I will be okay. But there's the flip side of this resolution that says we're not doing as much as we could to protect our kids by not masking them and allowing COVID to spread through our school. Anything further, Jim? No. I would like to, to make some comments and then we'll move to a vote. Um, it won't come as any surprise because I've personally voted against mask mandates. I've discussed many times in past board meetings uh, how important I think parent choice is for medical decisions for their students. This is a really important topic and it's not just important to the board, it's important to our community, to our, to our students, to their families. And on these kinds of, of decisions, I think it's incredibly important to get the opportunity provided to our community for their input, to our parents for their input, and the board in the long run does make the decision, but I think it's important that we seek out input on these kind of decisions. <coughs> I will express that I do have a lot of concerns with our current practices. I've shared those with Mr. Miller. For instance, I think that if we have given and granted mask exemptions, the request of a parent for individual students for specific circumstances, then I think that should be applicable and honored throughout the school day. And that's just my stance on that. And I know there are a lot that do not agree with that, but that's where I feel it's really important. Another example, I'm troubled by a story. We just received a story from a parent this week about what they were calling an isolation table in the cafeteria, and especially for our youngest kids. And that really concerns me, and it's something I would like us to review and understand if, if we're really doing the right thing there. I'm very concerned about that. And thank you to the parent that notified us about that so that we were aware. I do think it's important that if we make a decision as we did at the very last board meeting to move it in a direction toward the policy committee and let it, work, let it work its way through that process that we don't change our minds at the very next meeting about it. I think that sends a message of um, a lack of credibility in our decision-making and that concerns me. The agenda meeting was held last week and this wasn't brought forward until today. There's a lot of information to absorb, both in the resolution that you wrote, which clearly you spent a great deal of time on. Um, it was five pages when I printed it out. And you did email to me last night 168 articles in support of your resolution. And I appreciate that, but I'm a very fast reader, but I couldn't begin to tackle all that in, in the right amount of time to do that. So in fairness to my fellow board members who the email was sent out this afternoon with all of that information. I'm not sure, I know some are working, I'm not sure that they did have a chance to receive it. It's not on the agenda for our community to have considered before tonight and to wade into some of that same information. And it's not light reading. Um, I think the board needs to have time to review the resolution and all the articles you sent, I think in fairness and in transparency for our community, they need to have that opportunity as well and the opportunity to weigh in. And finally, as some have mentioned on the board, there are potential liability issues that we could face by hurrying through, through this process. And I feel like the, the policy committee process is going to give us a greater opportunity to address those kind of issues like liability, seek greater um, input from our board council if that's what we need to do. And specifically referring to policy 8450, which is what the policy committee would be reviewing to understand what we need to do differently with that. I think there is a lot to be said. I've said it before. I think I said it six months ago in a board meeting that this pandemic is something we have to learn to live with. It's not going to go away and we need to address it as an ongoing health concern that we have to address just as we do any other. And I feel that the policy process may help us to consider how do we make that transition and would really like the policy committee and you're sitting on that committee so you'll have an opportunity for a voice there. And I hope that you'll take those concerns to the policy committee and really help us to move from where we are to a different place in the future. How do we do that transition? So with that being said, I am going to go ahead and call the question yeah, and ask please. for a motion. Can I say something? I'm going to go ahead and call the question because we have a great deal of information so tonight I can't to get rebuttal. to. I can't say, have a comment to what you were saying. I'm going to call the question, Mrs. Bowney. 
for not allowing me to speak. So the motion on the table is to amend the agenda to accept the resolution presented by Mrs. Bodie. I have seconded. Jenny, would you please call the roll for the board? Mrs. Bodie. You have to vote. She just called your name. Okay, what was the question? I'm sorry. It was the, uh, to amend the agenda to include the resolution. Yes. Mrs. O'Connor? No. Mr. Adi? No. Mrs. Casper? No. The motion fails and we'll move on with our agenda. Thank you again, Mrs. Bodie, for bringing that forward. We'll look forward to further discussion in the future. We have a move to action item four, approval of agenda. I'm sorry, approval of personnel. Matt, do you have any comments? O'Connor, Mrs. O'Connor, I'm sorry. We still, we still do need to approve the agenda. We just okay, thank you. Thank you. No, that was entirely my miss. It's okay. I'll accept a motion to approve the agenda as presented. So moved. Thank you, Kelly. Do second. I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. D. Any discussion? With no discussion, we'll move forward. Would you call the roll, please, Mrs. Logan? Mrs. Casper? Yes. Mr. Adi? Yes. Mrs. Bodie? Yes. Mrs. O'Connor? Yes. And I'll remind board members, be sure you're leaning forward and speaking into your mic because at the back of the room and on the video, they won't be able to hear us otherwise. All right, we'll now move to action item four, approval of personnel. Mr. Miller, any comments before we move further with that? Just that they're the routine items that we'll bring forward during the work sessions, just so we can keep everything moving. Thank you. And um, I did note and would like you to make perhaps um, follow up at the next board meeting that you'd answered the question that we'd ask about resignations at the last meeting. And yep. if you would surface that at the next board meeting, that'd be great. Sure. Thank I can you. Do that. I'll take a motion to approve the um, approve the personnel items in four. I have something to say on that. Let's take a motion first, and then we'll have discussion. Again. Like I this discussion. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Would you like to make the motion? Okay. To approve the I make a motion. Thank you, Mr. Adi. Do I have a second? A second. Good. Thank you, Mrs. Bodie. Discussion? Yes. Yep. So, um, so I saw that there were 11 resignations um, with the information that you emailed us um, right before the meeting that I read. Um, there was 11 resignations within the first two months. Um, so what, so who is, who is in charge of hiring these um, people for these positions? What process do they go through to get the right fit for the right role? And um, do, we, do we outsource a hiring or who is in charge of hiring? Hiring is done through human resource department. And sometimes it will be the building principal depending on the position. Sometimes it would be a supervisor, depending on the position. Sometimes it's central office, depending on the position. Okay. Yep. So it's, there's not a that is hiring people, making sure that they're, they're the right fit for that right. Technically role. it's a board of education that approves, but there wouldn't be one person. It just goes back to whatever the, generally speaking, whoever the supervisor of that person is going to be. So at the board of, um, if the board approves, then should we have each person applying for a position, speak in front of the board? Well, that would be really hard to do. Right. Um, and that's not the board of education's role, but you do approve all of them. Right. So my is then who is making sure that we are asking the right people for the right roles. So we do not have people, 11 people quitting within the first two months of their of their. I think if you, if you um, I don't want to duplicate any efforts. So at the very bottom of that email, I don't know if you saw the, yeah. Uh, information from Mr. Kramer, who's our executive director of HR, when he comments that sometimes it's not a good fit. But when you have almost 2,000 employees, 11 resignations in the first two months, doesn't seem like it's that big of a number. That's not to say it's not important for each one of those 11. It, it certainly is. But um, in the grand scheme of things and the numbers being the numbers, I think it probably falls into the normal range. Okay. 
And it's not really unusual in this. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. It's not really unusual in the in the in the support staff, um, the cafeteria aides. Mr. Craig can correct me if I'm wrong. In the cafeteria aides, it's not really unusual for that to be a large turnover just because of the nature of the job. Right. And I um, think. Oh, sorry. It, that's okay. It's, for instance, a cafeteria aide. And correct me if I'm wrong. If I remember correctly, you are required to be there from eleven to one. It's kind of in the middle of your day and you can't really. So people take the jobs sometimes in hopes of either working their way into a different job within the school district or within the building sometimes. I think the other thing to remember is that with all of the changes that we've had, there are far more paying higher paying jobs out in the community Absolutely. that weren't there before. And so perhaps we're competing against the private sector for employees as well. And I think, Mr. Adi, you had something? Yes. Um, among the 11 uh, uh, that I resigned, do you know where, uh, are they going to a competition? Do you know where they're going to? Or is there any reason why they are leaving, maybe for a better opportunity somewhere? I, I think I think it's a mix and a combination. Um, of the 11, I can tell you, and I'm just, I know some of them have um, higher paying offers somewhere else. I think with the influx too of, of COVID and, and the whole, I mean, it's not just Lakota. I mean, it's everywhere is, is hiring and certainly there's a, a job shortage out there. I did get uh, an email from one of those 11 that um, they were very upset when we did not mandate mask anymore. And so she said, she's out. So, you know, there's, there's that side too. And so every decision that we make, there's a, a point and counterpoint to it. But again, 11 out of, as many people as we hire is not, you know, abnormal. So, okay. If maybe one person didn't like the uh, um, uh, mask uh, policy, but yep. one the, out of the other yeah. ten, yeah, would that have been something we would have done to prevent them from leaving? Yeah, I mean, was there negotiation or something? I wouldn't say there's negotiation, but she sent me a very lengthy email that that said that in that case. Um, but, you know, people have other opportunities. A lot of times we don't hear why, you know, they just have a better job or they get better hours. If we hire somebody on second shift or third shift and they have an opportunity somewhere else for a first shift or it works better for their family. But in, in your opinion, what would we have, we have done to stop that leakage? Um, we've done some exit interviews is what we, what we have been doing with some of the people. Um, they have a lot of connection too with their building administrators um, or their supervisors. So. Um, but I have not heard anything specifically that someone's leaving because they're not happy with their boss or, you know, the district overall or something like that. It might just be something they don't agree with and they just want a, a better opportunity for themselves. I mean, everybody that we're hiring on this list presumably is coming from somewhere else. So, I mean, that's a, another thing to consider. Did that address your question? Yeah, that was a good point. I'm okay. just trying to understand. Um, yeah. And that's why I'm asking these questions. Sure. The, the other thing was uh, we had a parent speaking about applying for positions and I saw that we are substitutes and I saw that we hired seven or eight substitutes. So that's great. Mm -hmm. um, I did speak with uh, the Butler County, um, Brenda from the Butler County Education System. Am I saying that right? Education mm -hmm. Service Center. Okay. Educational okay. Services. And she did say that they are extremely backed up. And I think it is only her working over there. And Matt, I know that someone looked at you to be responsible for that. But I don't think that's something that you are responsible for. I think it is the Butler County Educational System. It's a contract that we do with them. So right. yes, the superintendent is responsible for it. Well, I mean, as far as the, the onboarding process. Or them being back and the workload. Yep. Mm -hmm. I think that is the person that we're contracting out to. I think they might need more people, more staff to process the applications to make it a faster process. So I just wanted to clarify that for the um, people that were potentially holding him accountable for that process. I don't think that is his, his, he has that authority. I think it is the Butler County Educational Service center. Services. Yeah. <laughs> that, I just say ESC. That ESC <laughs> that, that needs the help, that needs more people, more staff. And I think the person you might have been talking to actually, Mr. Kramer, emailed them directly. And I think they're getting through that. Okay. If it's the same one. 
Right. That's all I had on that. Thank you. You know, it would be helpful for our new people to have an acronym key list sitting at the table. Seriously. It would be very helpful. There's, there's a lot to wait. Through, so. <laughs> Thank One you. Of those in education comments, Mrs. Bodie. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Alphabets. <laughs> so I have a motion on the floor to approve the personnel recommendations. Is there any further discussion? We're losing Please. four good teachers. Go ahead. We're losing four good teachers in that retirement that are yeah. retiring. Mm -hmm. We are. I kind of hate seeing those come out, to be honest. I know, I hate the <laughs> retirement ones. So there's a motion on the floor, and we are now going to vote on it. Would you call it, Mrs. Logan? Mr. Adi? Yes. Mrs. Bodie? Yes. Mrs. Casper? Yes. Mrs. O'Connor? Yes. We move to item five on our agenda, the master facilities plan. What we plan to do tonight is basically a review of where we're at, where things stand, give the board an opportunity, including our new board members, an opportunity to ask questions or look for further information. And we are not planning to do any votes on this plan tonight. This is just for the purpose of the board being brought up to speed. And Mrs. Schaefer, will you please speak up if you have any comments that you wanna make? I don't wanna forget you in this process. Matt, would you please go ahead and would you introduce your staff? I'm going to turn it over to the master of ceremonies tonight, Chris Passage, and let him do all the introductions because I'm fearful that I'll miss somebody. Great. Well, thank you for the time this evening to discuss the master facilities plan. As uh, Mrs. O'Connor stated, we've been working on this plan for going on three years now. So um, with COVID and everything else, it's a good time to get new board members up to date and current board members up to date. It's, um, we've had a lot of changes over the past few months. So I'm um, looking forward to going over this information. Um, tonight really is the cliff note version of the binders that you all have. So uh, I brought out the most important aspects of um, our discussions and what I think is important for the board to hear. It doesn't mean that I'm trying to exclude any other information. It's just trying to condense two and a half years worth of work into a work session. So please, if you have any so you questions, did well. thank you. If you have any questions, um, let me know. I may not have the answer for you tonight, but I'll be glad to make sure that we get the note and can bring it back. I see this as one of several uh, ongoing sessions where we work and have dialogue about this, this process and this plan going forward. So I do appreciate the time. I did, I did throw it to you and stop, but we're not making a decision tonight. No, no, this is just strictly informational update okay. for the Board of Education. Now, basically, this is our new facilities committee. So the committee work starts now. We are. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, before I get too far into the information, I want to uh, just acknowledge a couple of people that are here that have been working on this with us. I have Craig Hatfield. He's our Senior Director of Operations at Lakota. Um, Mr. Hatfield is my right-hand person, all things facilities and child nutrition and a lot of other things. We also have Jim Boris here from uh, VSWC Architects. He's been our point person through this whole process, helping us guide, um, guide us through this process, being a, a good advocate for our plan. And he has a uh, lot of background working with a, a variety of school districts across the state with the master facility plan process. And uh, we also have Ashley Hussein here. She's also from VSWC. She works a lot with uh, Betsy Fuller, our communications director, to help make sure um, when we do have ideas that are coming about, um, we do want to share information with our community. They help to strategize how we can get this information out for our, our community going forward. So um, I'm going to start a little bit in a different place than typical. See how this. So I want to talk about just talking a little bit about the difference between a master facilities plan and a capital long term capital plan. Um, what we're doing in this master facilities plan really it's a strategic look of how we want to um, have our facilities look over the next 20, 30, 40 years. Um, we're looking at ed educational delivery models that we want to. Um, deliver and how our facilities can help support those models and those trends that we see in education. So this is really a strategic look and um, it's, it's different than a capital plan, which is more of a 
we're looking, it's a tactical look over the next three to five to 10 years about what we have currently in our buildings, what needs to be replaced, what needs to be maintained. So the difference in them is um, there's a lot more community involvement, engagement, um, a lot more broad thinking around what could our facilities be and look like in the future with a master facilities plan. And a capital plan is more uh, budget and planning focus where we know we have these facilities, we know these things we need to maintain, update and keep current. So that's the two difference. Um, and really, if you have a approved master facilities plan, it really would help out your capital planning process. So um, with my team, if they have a master facilities plan to refer back to when we come time to make decisions about capital spending, if there's a plan in place, we can refer to saying, hey, at this period of time in, in the process, this building is gonna be decommissioned or what have you. So we're not gonna invest putting a brand new roof on the building that's gonna be decommissioned in a couple of years. So if we have this long-term plan, it helps us do our daily capital planning as well. So any questions around the difference between a master plan and a capital plan? Hearing none, I'll keep moving forward then. Um, I also thought it was important to take a look back at a, a previous history of Lakota's master plan. Um, I'm not gonna go too, too far back, but the most recent master plan that was completed by Lakota was really completed back in the early 2000s. Um, Lakota was going through tremendous growth at that time. And we were just looking uh, on how to make sure we had this enough facilities to accommodate our increased enrollment. We're growing anywhere between 400 to 900 students a year. So if you think about that, that's a whole new school building per year. And the team back then was really looking at a master plan on how to accommodate that, that growth in our district. So um, when you look at our previous master plan, what came out of that? So a lot of it you can see today. Um, so if you look at both East and West High School, you know, you had a whole new wing of classrooms that were added in that master plan, an auxiliary gym, the new office at the, at the front of each building at East and West was added. Um, when that, before that master plan was implement, implemented, we had one freshman building. The current West freshman building was a freshman building. So all kids from East and West went to the current West freshman building. And we had over 1300 kids in one building. Um, and the master plan at that time said, we're gonna separate the buildings and have an East feeder and a West feeder. So that was part of that master plan as well. Um, so we constructed the East freshman on that master plan. We constructed two new schools to help accommodate the growth. We constructed Wyandotte and Endeavor as part of that master plan. Uh, we completed a complete renovation of Liberty ECS and added four classrooms in that master plan. We constructed the new, now the current Union Elementary building at its new location. The former location is at the Boys and Girls Club location right now. We used to have Union Elementary there. This moved to its new location and was uh, built. That was part of that previous master plan. We did uh, an office renovations and some updates to Hopewell Elementary. Um, and part of that too, in a master plan, it's not just about facilities, it's about your educational model and delivery. And at that time, we moved from one early childhood school, which was LEC Creekside, to four early childhood schools. That was part of that master plan visioning process as well. So we went from Creekside, which is now Creekside, was the LECC, to four early childhood schools um, with a Wyandotte, Liberty, and Shawnee, moving from an elementary school to an early childhood school. Uh, we reconfigured um, K-6 attendance boundaries a number of times to look at how to accommodate the growth areas in the district. Um, and again, much of this planning in this master facilities plan was based on um, to how to accommodate the, the growth in the code at that time. So that brings us to where from, and basically that was done from early 2000s to around 2009 with that time frame where everything was implemented. So that gives you an idea about how that master plan was implemented. And just like all master plans, um, when you approve a master plan, eventually it, it's not a static document that just sits there and you look at it. It's a breathing, living document that you look at on a regular basis and you go through and you, you change and adapt to what your community needs at that time. So since 2009, we've done a lot of great things um, that wasn't really included in the initial master facilities plan. For instance, um, um, after our last levy, we built 11 new safe secure entrances in our buildings. 
That was never part of the original master plan in the early 2000s. You know, times change, schools became a target for violence. And we had um, some schools that were vulnerable and took the opportunity to make sure we could secure those better. Um, we offered all day kindergarten since then. That was never a plan um, with that master facilities plan. So you wanna offer all day kindergarten programming. So what does that do to your facilities? So basically we went from four element or early childhood centers to six to accommodate that plan. So that was not included in the original plan. Um, in addition, we, we've re renovated these media centers and innovation hubs. Um, we've added new things like cyber, incubator U, um, product lead the way things. We converted the Joaquini Academy to our career readiness academy. All those things were never included in that master plan in the early 2000s, but we evolved and changed based on the needs of our, our students. So I just wanna make that clear that as we go through this process, when we have a master plan, that's not gonna be set in stone and it would be great to do a lot of the things, but those things are gonna change as the needs of our community change going forward. So I just wanna make sure that we understand that and that's clear. So that brings us to where we are today. We have six early childhood schools, eight elementary schools, four junior schools, two freshman schools, two high schools and one career readiness. So that's our, where we are today. Um, so any questions on history on, on the master facility? I miss anything. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yes, probably for the most part, I don't know how many questions you'll get tonight because I think there's a lot to absorb in the information, but be Perfect. prepared for an onslaught next time. Oh, I'm sure, I hope so. Okay. <laughs> that's, the whole, that's the whole idea is just to really have this collaborative talk and, and look at things, so. Can I ask a question? Of, of course. Um, so we typically with facilities plans, you plan for a 30 to 40 years out, but 20 years later, 15, 10 years later, we're coming to the board with a new facilities plan. So is it, and I'm just asking because I'm, do we, should we plan out 30, 40 years or should we scale that back a little bit? Is that more of a um, better decision or? Well, I guess it really depends on where your district is. At that time, we were trying to manage growth and that was the main priority of this district was to manage the growth. Now we're at a point where we have, um, we have still have some growth, but it's not as, as evident. So maybe our plans can last longer than the 20 years they have lasted. Maybe not, we don't know. Maybe in the next 10, 15 years, we have another upsurge or, or something else we need to consider, but at least you have an idea of where you wanna be in that time frame. doesn't mean that you'll end up there. That makes sense. Yes, and I think that Westchester is mostly built out, but Liberty Township, is the one that we're concerned about because there is still room for growth there. But once that is built out, we are really just basically predicting 30 to 40 years down the road because the, the growth, the opportunity of growth is um, with buildings and, and whatnot, it just isn't there. It's just gonna be a different type of- like, It's not just new buildings though. Climate. It's also right. how we utilize our old buildings and maintenance of our capital assets. Right. So Westchester, especially with some of the age of some of the buildings that we're dealing with, mm -hmm. is absolutely critical to this. In terms of new growth, um, you're right. Liberty is where the new growth is going to be, and we need to have a new demographic study and some other pieces that help to, to wreck that. But it definitely don't think that it's just one township. We definitely have to deal with the older as well as the new. Because at some point, too, those Westchester homes will flip. Yes. So your empty nesters will move out and young families. And then your demographics go back yes. up again in your yeah. older <coughs> district. So like a, it's a cycle. Thank you. Like a pie. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Please continue. All right. Um, so that brings us to where we are right now with our current master facility process. Um, the board back in 2018 passed a strategic plan. I think we're probably getting close to looking at another one, but as part of that strategic plan is why this work started was to update our master facilities plan. So that's how this whole committee got started was based off the previous board's strategic plan saying we needed to update that and look at it. So, and again, it's not just looking at that, it's looking at your capital investments and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Our buildings are our largest capital investment that this community has made. So we wanna make sure we keep that on the front, um, front burner for those types of things. So, um, there are five main components of a master facilities plan that we're going to sort of take a deep dive into. Um, we, we won't go through, um, we're not at the point to go through all of them, but um, the five areas are facility assessments. We'll, we'll take a deep dive into what we've done so far. And that includes any kind of architectural reviews, infrastructure and system reviews, 
uh, technology, plumbing, HVAC, um, educational adequacy of the buildings that they align with our educational delivery models. Um, we'll look at facility surveys and site circulations. So that's part of our, our facility assessment piece. Um, then we'll look at how we evaluate things. We look at our building capacities. We look at um, educational programming and capacities. Our district enrollment, are we growing? Are we um, flat? Are we uh, uh, different parts of our district uh, growing at different rates? So we'll, we'll take a deep dive and look at how we, some of the things we did to evaluate our district. <coughs> Look at, uh, again, we'll look at boundary, we, boundary changes in attendance areas are, are things that we will look at. Not everything has to be a brick and mortar solution for everything that we do. And again, we'll look at grade configurations as well. What grade configurations are um, most conducive to our educational delivery models and what makes the most sense. Um, the, the third focus area we call Envision. So this is really a brainstorming session, getting some feedback from your community and stakeholders. Um, you'll look at your, your current buildings, um, we'll look at your future buildings, um, your educational delivery models. Um, you get, you, we went through some processes with our staff, our students, our community, a board of education to get their insights about where we think our facilities are now and where they could be in the future. So it's really a brainstorming what if type of, type of process that we went through and we'll continue to go through. Um, the fourth area is uh, develop master plan options. Uh, we'll definitely get into that tonight. Um, we'll consider the data we, we used in the first three parts with the assessments, the uh, evaluate and the envision piece. We'll start developing some options to consider uh, moving forward for the board and our community. We have a lot of things we've got to look at <coughs> as far as cost, uh, phasing, uh, engagement of further engagement of our community staff. So there's a lot of things that we still need to do um, as far as that area. And the last part of um, the master facility process really is a final recommendation and approval. So we are not even close to that yet. Um, we, the uh, previous committee has worked all the way up through uh, area number four. And this new committee will sort of absorb what we've done so far, take that information, and we'll start moving forward of how we uh, continue to look at um, developing a final product. Um, so before the pandemic hit, um, we got up to area four developing options. So we'll talk about that again tonight. Um, my, my goal tonight this evening is really to look at what the previous committee did. And the previous committee, just so everybody knows, is the superintendent, the treasurer, uh, community relations director. We had Craig Hatfield from business ops, our architect, and we had two board members uh, on the committee that did a, a lot of this core work that we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, it is, is when I talked to Matt about this going forward, I really wanted to have the entire board going forward. I didn't want to have just a two member committee, nothing against board members, but sometimes you guys are so busy, you guys don't get to talk. And it's really um, some rich conversations that we have. It's an important decision process that we have to go through and to have all five board members there to go through that process, hear the same thing at the same time, be able to ask questions, get updates and hear it real time. I think is very valuable for, for us as a working group to really look at this and not have to rely on committee members to get that information out or look at some documents that you, you can look at if it doesn't translate to what that discussion was during that committee meeting. So I appreciate everyone here taking the time to expand the committee to the full board because I think it's going to be really beneficial for us moving forward. Um, all right, so that was Part one, if you want to go to uh, you have the scope area, it's the next area we're going to talk about, scope area one. And that's really our facility this, assessment. Just Good. for the sake of timing, are you planning to get through all of this this evening? Can we talk faster? <laughs> uh, might want to. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a lot. Oh, I'll talk faster. Um, Assessment. I'm actually teasing, but just be aware of timing. Uh, assessments were done by different groups, um, various groups. So we have Lakota assessments that were done. We have what we call the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission that also does assessments. So um, we'll get into a little bit more about the OFCC and what they do and uh, what our team does. So first of all, Lakota, in conjunction with our architects and engineers, we go through on a regular basis and we look at our facilities. Um, we look at our facility needs, but we look at it from a planning and budgeting perspective. What do we need? 
over the next one to three to five years. Um, we also look at things over the next six to 10 years as well. Um, even beyond that, some of our roofs, our parking lots, things of that nature, we have 20 year plans for those. So we have an idea from a capital expenditure plan, what we need to do to invest in our current buildings. The OFCC, the Ohio um, Facilities Construction Commission, um, they are a state agency that sort of set the guidelines for all public uh, facilities in the state of Ohio, not just schools, but all public facilities. So the OFCC, um, they come at um, their assessments from a different lens. They have developed what they call the Ohio School Design Manual. And what they do is they look at all the current trends and facilities and designs, and they say, okay, in the year, I think the latest design manual was from 2020. So what should a school look like in the year 2020? So that is their lens. So when they go look at any facility that we have, they'll look at a facility from 1984 that was built in 1984 and say, okay, what from our lens do we need to do to take a 1984 facility and make it relevant to 2020 standards? So that is the OCC's lens that they look through. Um, they look at trying to make everything current to what a 2020 building would look like. So when you go through and you see some um, cost analysis from the OFCC, just, just remember you may have some sticker shock when you see those numbers. So it's just the fact that we may not do everything that's listed there, but it gives you a data point that this committee <laughs> can use to look at going forward about when we make decisions about facilities. Well, and toward that point, it's also a decision for the board whether or not they plan to bring the buildings up to that code. Correct. Is the money that we'll actually receive through that process worthwhile enough to justify those additional costs that might be entailed? Right. And, you know, the OCC is not an uh, end-all, be-all. It's just another data point that we can it's use. It's an that. option. It's an option we can consider, some data we can use to help make decisions. So there are other organizations besides the OFCC that we can get this data from? Not that they want to give, not that want to give money to us. They will give us money. Yeah. Oh, so the if we go with the OFCC, they will give us money. Some. Yes. Yeah, okay. The way that works with the OFCC, they they um they call co-funding options. So um, school districts are all ranked every year from the OFCC, and they'll rank and they'll say, okay, if you want to participate in our program, we will help co-fund some of your construction projects. Mm. But basically, you got to follow our rules. And our rules are the Ohio School Design Manual. Nowadays, most of the school designs are designed according to the design manual. So it's not something that's so out of bounds or unique. It's really the standard for building schools nowadays. But it may have some implications about um, our community decisions on how we want our schools to look, whether we want to do that or not. Currently, right now, um, our, our, our share is 26%. Uh, so they would fund 20% of any projects that we do that are approved in our master facilities plan. But we could take a look at the numbers and if they, if we could support this on our own without that 20, 26% contribution and decide what is best for our school and our students besides going by the guidelines that they say you have to follow. Absolutely. So we would basically be underneath a, another you have to do this type of thing if you want this money. Correct. Okay. And that's just another, like I said, another data point this committee we have to make at that time, whether that 26% is worth it or not. Right. Um, I know previous boards have declined to do that because the percentage was below, I think it was around the 15, 16%, 18% at the most. And they thought that contribution from the state was not worth the, the, uh, the strings that were tied to that money. So that's Chris, definitely an option this board. This was the make. percentage two years ago. It's and still the percentage. It, it hasn't changed. It hasn't changed. That's interesting. And we've confirmed that. I'm surprised that hasn't changed at all. It, yeah, it's pretty. There hasn't been a whole lot going on, so it's been pretty flat for a while. Um, and by the time we get a master facilities plan done, maybe that it could go up or down. It, it could, it's not always going to go up. It could go up or down. So. As we get closer to making decisions about a final master plan, we'll definitely get that information updated and, and know exactly where we stand on that list and how much would be co-funded if we decide to go that route. So as of right now, just think of it as approximate. Correct. Correct. We're in okay. that range right now. Okay. And I, I just want to say, if you want to take a drink. <laughs> yeah. I, I um, to, to your point, so it doesn't have to be an all or nothing either. So we could have LFI, so locally funded initiatives. So if there's a project that, UFCC says we'll 
contribute 26% or whatever that percentage for X, mm -hmm. but as a board and community, we decided we want something different. We can still do that portion on our own, but it would cost us 100%, but we could, to your point, we could do that that way. Thank you. Sure. One of the things that we're gonna talk about <coughs> the OCC um, is it what we call a condition rating. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna see this in a lot of our documents. Um, so I wanna talk through it a little bit. Really the OCC looks at your facilities and they do, it's a strictly, it's a math equation. It's a data point and it's something that um, we can look at in, in a more of a deep dive, but they look at the cost to renovate a school divided by the cost to replace a school. Um, and we, we call that the uh, school condition rating. So if a school, when you take those costs and percentage it between zero to 65%, they consider that building satisfactory and you really don't have to do anything to it. If you want to make some renovations, you can, um, but in their eyes, it's a satisfactory building. If you do that math equation and it's between 66 and 68%, they consider that a borderline um, building where you may need to make a decision if you want to renovate that building or replace that building. And the last one is if it's uh, greater than 66%, um, the, the cost uh, to renovate versus replace, they consider that building deficient and they recommend them replacing that building. That's just the standard um, <coughs> they use right now. It doesn't mean it's 100% like that all the times. Um, buildings can look at waivers for those types of things that, if they want to participate. So it's just, like I said, another data point. And if we decide to go that direction to participate with the OCC, there'd be further dialogue and communication about do we want to do what, not do waivers um, and those types of things. But that's sort of their baseline as far as what they think should be replaced and what should be renovated. Um, so in some of our documents, you'll see that. And, and um, that's what we use as our baseline right now as well. Um, and as, as Matt said too, locally funded initiatives, we can do anything locally, um, as long as the community supports it, we can, we can do anything. We don't have to rely on the OCC for anything. Um, so now if you, if you want to look at, I added a couple documents that we can go through and discuss that a little bit. Um, basically the sheet right here, the OCC school conditioning rating that is in your packet just outlines exactly what I just said. Mm -hmm. And when we go through our documents here, you'll see the uh, green, yellow, and red. So if you see the green, is considered satisfactory by the OCC standard, yellow is a borderline, and uh, red is considered um, efficient. So again, it's just a um, data point to use. It's not going to the slot I want. There we go. So um, I won't go too, too detailed into this information here, but basically <laughs> this is a snapshot um, of our current building. Uh, has some statistics about the year it was built. Um, you see multiple years or renovations or additions done to that. That's what that means. It gives you the red, green, or yellow status from the OCC based on that. It gives you the current square footage. Um, it gives you the current 2020s cost. Uh, to renovate versus replace. Um, and it gives you some enrollment information that the OCC did and the uh, utility costs. Um, basically, this is another data point for us to take a deep dive into at a later session. But I just wanted you to have this as sort of a snapshot about where our buildings are right now. I had a question under building age slash years. Like on Liberty, can you explain those numbers? There's 99, 67, 58, 48, and 10. Yeah, those are um, when the original building was built and, each, and if there's any additions to that building, that's the years those additions were, were added to that building for Liberty. Like, it's the number of years ago. It's not. It's 99. Year. Yeah. 99. It's 99 years old. It was built. Then the next part, of that building was added to on several times. Okay. And the next part of that building was 67 years old. And another addition was 58 years old. So that's how that goes. The last one we did was part of the last master plan is 10, it's over 10 years old now, but it was part of the uh, master plan. So those are the age of any additions that were done to that building. If so, you just see one number, there's no additions to that building. So in Shawnee, a lot, the last time we made additions was 26 years ago. 26, correct. And Freedom, 
Hopewell Junior. Those are the oldest buildings that we have yet to make additions to if needed. And they're mostly in West. Right. That's not modifications that could be renovations, right? No, um, mostly it's additions. Renovations aren't included. Those are just additions. Okay. You know, we, we do renovations and updates through our capital planning, so that's not included here. These are just additions. And the last piece of information on this section is um, just to give you a snapshot, I did talk about capital planning. Um, this gives you a snapshot about um, the big buckets that we plan on in our buildings, the, the different things that we look at, <coughs> set it up like the five year forecast type of look where you had the previous couple of years of what we spent on our, our facilities in different areas and what we're projected to spend um, on our facilities over the next several years. So this is a snapshot look, sort of like a five-year forecast for our capital spending. So just so we have an idea of what areas uh, we spend our capital dollars on. And we have a whole detailed spreadsheet, spreadsheet behind this that um, details exactly what we're doing, what improvements are being made, what buildings are getting the improvements. So it's a, uh, and we prioritize those as high, medium, and, and low priorities. So um, just because you see our budget process here between two and $3 million, that's not the total need, that's what's our budgeted. So our needs are probably four to $5 million a year or more in, in needs. Say that number again. Four to 5 million at least a year in, in needs. And we can take a deeper dive into those numbers when we come back for a future thing and look at, here's all the things that we have listed for a building. Here's all the things we have planned. Here's all the things that we're putting off. So you just basically prioritize every year. What? We do. We do. We always have the surprises. Something may fail right. here or there. Um, so we always have a contingency for things that aren't planned. So Chris, one of the questions that I've asked many years has been wants versus needs. And if I could see that laid out, <coughs> I would really appreciate it if next time we have this discussion, if you can lay that out for the board in depth. Yeah. To the yeah. best of your ability. We can, and It'd probably just be easier to have Craig uh, bring the spreadsheet that we use. We can list everything for a few buildings and just look at it. And this is say, here's everything that's been requested for this building. And here's everything that we prioritize as, as a need for this building. Yeah, and we so, work with the, the building administrators. I mean, we, we know what the, the impact of the building from your, your street, your key strategical, your roofing projects, uh, your parking lots to HVAC and mechanical and so forth. But we do uh, have a close dialogue with all the principals. We break down the wants and the needs of the building and also prioritize them. So, you know, this this is a working document that sort of clumps it and lumps it everything together. Uh, but what we use in our other spreadsheet is more critical and it lays out the information, and the act, actual need as well as estimated cost. And then, you know, what we can, you know, uh, more or less coincide with that $3 million rank with our normal capital planning as we work with the treasurer's office as we go from year to year. So. I think uh, that would be very helpful to the board when you look at all the mm -hmm. possible wants and yeah. pieces that we could do to the buildings versus what we actually need to do. That would really be helpful to see. Yeah, definitely. The second part, and this is a question geared, and I know you have a question, Mr. D. This is geared towards something we've been hearing from our community, particularly with dealing with the pandemic issues. But over the last couple of years, what changes have we made on a general basis to our HVAC systems? Um, we've really looked at where we can um, improving the airflow in our buildings, doing the, the number of exchanges of air that take place on a on a on a basis for increasing that. And we uh, where we can, and where the systems will allow it, we've increased our filter MERV rating to improve our filter MERV rating, to make sure we can capture the smaller particles. Um, not all of them can accept. Not all the HVAC equipment can accept higher higher rated MERV filters because it will clog up the system and they won't function and will cause issues. So where we can put an improved MERV filter in that has a better rating, we've done that. And increasing the number of air exchanges is what we've done mostly. And longer and longer airflow air flow change out as the day goes. Because normally when you're, an, you go from an occupied to an unoccupied status. So you're reducing your, your energy conservation. So in this case, we just tried to turn the systems and extend that throughout the day. So we would be turning airflow even when kids weren't there just because of that need. Is it fair to say we've done something something in all of our buildings? Oh yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, I'm not sure we've really talked about it that much, so that might be something to share a little bit more depth too, Mr. D. Yes, I have questions um, regarding uh, the service center remodel. 
and the IP security camera system. That's not projection for, for those ones. Is there any reason for that? For the security systems? Yes, a service center remote on. We're, we're, um, you're talking about the remodel for the service center, why there's not? Yes, there's no projection for those, yeah. Did you understand the question? The service, it's, I think it's two questions on the service center remodel. Why is there nothing from 2020 on toward that? Oh, because we're not going to remodel anything at the service okay. center. Okay. No. And then the IP cameras, we're currently in the process of working into phase two. So it's not there just because we don't have the actual numbers. But yeah, we've uh, we went through our first phase of cameras upgrades in all the high schools and junior highs. And now our next phase is coming. Uh, hopefully this summer, that's something Mr. Prasards and I are working through with phase phase two is more focused on all of our elementaries. So we've targeted junior highs and high schools are complete. Uh, now we're working towards the uh, the elementaries. So phase two dollars have not been put into this spreadsheet. No, they have not, saying. no. No, that would be answer? forthcoming. Okay. Yeah, this is a one of the, the ever working documents as as we we use uh, the years progress because uh, like Chris had mentioned, you know, we look at our parking lots. Uh, this is a 20 year plan for every building that we will touch. And we're in year six of touching every building of that 20 years. And it's a similar system for all of our uh, roofing projects. So we, we work with uh, an auditor to really help us stay on track so we can uh, piece all of the roofing numbers that we need to, to make those repairs on a regular basis. But as I was showing Mr. Voorhees here, uh, it's amazing. We've got you know, almost 40 acres of roofs if you look at all, all of our buildings and our assets. So it's quite astronomical and uh, it takes a lot of forth planning when it comes to capital planning as well as what we're talking about, the master facility plan. Thank you. Any other questions? I did not hear what you said. For the junior high and high schools, were you implementing, what were you doing in phase one with those schools? Oh, that was cameras. Cameras. Yeah, we upgraded to camera oh. systems. Yeah, we've already done that at we the junior the high level cameras. and the high school levels. We replaced all the camera systems and security systems there for IPs. Now we're, we started at the high school with the junior highs. Now we're going down to the elementary buildings to improve the camera system. Is there. there a camera system in every room? No, no. In the, no. Yes, that's that was going to be no. my question. In camera systems are basically in hallways, common areas, okay. exterior. We don't have them in classrooms. Yeah, I, I didn't think so, but I was just double checking. <laughs> and then the other thing was, do we have um, a program or um, is there something out there that I, there was someone mentioned it, I can't remember the name of it, but they are trying to incorporate systems into every classroom so that potentially those who cannot make it to school can actually go online and watch the class as they are um, it live. Would that be something additional that we would be discussing that wouldn't be in the facilities plan? We, we could. Um, we had some teachers that did that during the pandemic. Um, we had so many that were out. Um, but it's actually, I just read something, but I, don't know, I just read something about that um, yesterday. It's really hard for a teacher to teach in person and then worry about the four boxes that are looking at him or her on the Zoom at the same time. It's not as easy as it might sound, but I mean, everything's open for discussion, sure. I think there are some schools that are actually incorporating this in Ohio. That's a good one. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Any questions about scope area one? All right, we'll move on to scope area two, what we call evaluate. So in this area, um, the two main things we'll, we'll talk about are, is our enrollment forecast. Um, part of the, uh, the process with the OCC and just master planning in general, you're trying to understand your, your enrollment now and in the future. So as part of that process, we had the OFCC go through and do a, an, an enrollment forecast for us. Um, and we'll talk about that maybe. Um, so in the very you know, the enrollment forecast and their grade configurations. So um, we'll go through the enrollment forecast first and just go a brief overview on that. And then we'll go in and talk about a great configuration <coughs> about what's been done. So this is what the uh, enrollment forecast looks like as far as um, the document that we received from a group called Future Think. And went in and um, 
the, 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 the enrollment forecast and looking at it. So um, basically it started from the 2021 school year and it goes out to the 2029, 2030 school year. So it gives you an idea that the, based on this information that the district is supposed to receive um, some growth over the next 10 years. Um, and, we'll, and we'll look at it. There's some, we won't get into all the detailed math, but there's some detailed math that show you over that 10 year period where that growth is. And as expected, that growth is gonna be in the Northern part of our district in Liberty Township. So um, you'll see most of that growth come from that area going forward. Uh, just to give you an idea um, from last year, um, the forecast to um, where we were actually, um, the forecast has what, 16, 8, 16, 8, 83. We were at 16, last year was our enrollment. Um, this year we're projected to be at the 16,894. We are currently at, as we look today, we're at 17,214. Mm -hmm. So that's four, 455 more students. It's almost a building. That's good. It's almost a building yep. that we have right now yep. um, compared to the forecast. So as we get deeper into this process, I'm sure we're going to have to go back and look at this forecast um, again and, and have it updated. Is this the company, the future thing down at the bottom? It is. Is that the company? That's the company that did that. Have we considered going back to McKibbins because they seem to provide pretty right on the nose forecast. We do have a forecast from them as well. We asked the OCC if we could use them and they, they wanted something because it was a year old at the time and they wanted something more recent and the OCC paid for it, they use this group. But we can I always like go somebody back. else paying for it, but still. Yeah, but yeah, McKibbin does go into a deep dive and <coughs> they go into um, our, our planning blocks that we use. So it would be my preference to go back to them, but from a OCC standpoint, they'll use these numbers right here. So, and I can go through and look at what McKibben had and what they have, and, and we can do a three-way look at actual McKibben in this at a next meeting. I think it would be worthwhile. There's a lot of money that goes into this planning if we're not being accurate. That doesn't seem like a great use of our resources. I agree. Um, again, uh, it'll go through a little good deep dive, but you can see at the end of the 10 year cycle where you see the growth. So like up, this is for ECS buildings up in Wyandotte from now, 10 years from now, you have 200 more kids. Heritage, you have 141, but you see that down in Westchester Township, Creekside is projected to have 182 less kids over that 10 year time frame. So it's a good just snapshot about where the district will be in the next 10 years from an overall enrollment for each uh, building. So. so with this being a prediction of 10 years, this might call for the dreaded word of redistricting Could a you little speak bit. into your mic a little bit more, please? Yeah. Yes, so in order to compensate for the growth, we might have to redistrict going, which is I know is a dreaded word, but that would probably be called for in the next couple of years to accommodate the growth. Yeah, you know, we know like our hotspots are in our Liberty Township school. So we need to look at some, especially like for Cherokee, uh, Cherokee is a hotspot and so is Wyandotte. So we'll definitely have to look at enrollment boundaries for those and see if there's any opportunities to help alleviate some of the um, capacity issues we may experience in those buildings by a non brick and mortar solution by looking at a boundary change. So that is on our, on our radar right now to start looking at for next year for Cherokee specifically. But we do not want to start family angst before we need to, um, right. in terms of redistricting. We'll, we'll do a due always, diligence. We do that every process. year. Something, if you lived in Lakota long enough, you know that's something we look at every year, every year just to make sure that <coughs> we don't want one building that's busting at the seams and having a hard time uh, with, with the kids and the spaces and, and other buildings at extra space. So we try to balance that out as best we can, but um, something that we continually look at. The one, the one cool thing uh, I'll add to it right now, whoever, uh, whatever boards or whatever community, I think it was a community process, developed the boundaries for the schools, hit the high schools right on. As you see, there's hardly any, we've had to do no changes since I've been here for the last 15 years, the high school boundaries. And if you look at the next 10 years, 
they're still pretty even as far as um, the numbers. So the high school boundaries have been something that we haven't ever touched and look out in the future. <laughs> yeah, look out into the future is something we would never have to really look at. So kudos to whoever did the boundaries for the high school stuff. So uh, I'll dive in real quick into um, grade configurations. Um, so part of the, uh, the, the look was for the district and um, the, the, the group to look at, hey, what's our current grade configuration? Do we get improvements by looking at um, different grade configurations moving forward? Um, we did bring this to the previous board at one point and we did have um, the board rank which ones they, they liked the best. So having a new board, uh, we probably need to review that and have a, another review of that to make sure you're still comfortable with the ones that were agreed upon before, or if we need to do something different, take this opportunity to look at something different. So if you look at the options we had, we had seven different options all the way from our current, current um, configuration to we've looked at what if the district went to a one building PK-12, one building 712. <coughs> <coughs> I don't think we could ever do that. Would be a massive building. Make life easier. I don't know if everybody was yelling on a good way, though. Uh -huh. but, no, nothing was in a good way. But we just we looked at it. You know, we wanted to really weed out all all options. So um, ones that boiled up to the top were options three, four, and five. Um, and we used this uh, this criteria down here, um, sort of as a as a guide. You know, it's hard. You can look through it and do anecdotal. Um, things and say, hey, I think this would be better, that would be better. We, so we try to put some kind of metric together to help us guide some of those decisions. And some of the, the criteria we used include like the, the child development stages, um, academic achievement, number of transitions. Number of transitions has been a topic for a lot of families. Good to go from a um, K2 building to a 3-6, to a 7-8, to a 9, to a 12. Just before you get comfortable in a building, you're moving to the next one. So that's something that's always been a topic for the last several years that I've been here. So looking at options that limit those number of transitions was a um, something that was attractive to um, the board at that time in the committee. Um, and we looked at a number of different things and we tried to do a score whether it was ideal, neutral or, or, or not ideal. So as you can see, um, the PK six and the 12 building was ideal because they're in the buildings for a long time, there's no transitions, but from a practical standpoint, um, it's not very practical. So the ones we focused on are, are pre-K three uh, or, or K three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, twelve. 12, uh, pre-K three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, twelve, 12, and K five, pre-K five or K five, six, seven, eight, nine, twelve. 12. The one thing that you'll see on there is nine, 12. All the, all the things that, were considered the best we're, we're having a 912 building and not a single room freshman building. That model worked for Lakota for a number of years. It may still work, um, but from for the most part, most people wanted to look at options that included high school being true nine through 12. So all the options that we looked at were, were really a nine through 12 option. Any questions about that or information? No. That would just be a massive. Yeah. I mean, that would just be massive trying to redistrict everyone and getting the nine through twelve in the same, in the same, same classroom yeah. and. Same I mean, building. I think it's that, great. Not that same we, classroom, same building. Same, same building. 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 Sorry, yes. Yeah. And yeah. it's still east west. We would. Right. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. But just looking at, and we'll get to it in some of the options. But just looking at how could we do that? So. We may not be able to do that, but we'll look at the options at least. Right. So one of our upcoming sessions will be walking through these with a really in-depth discussion, right? Yep. Okay. You, you don't want to do that tonight? <laughs> I think we need to give our whole team a chance. I'd love to have Julie in the room too, but our whole team a chance to think about this packet before I, they have uh, to Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll just skim over the uh, Envision piece um, real quick because we, we still have a lot more envisioning that we still need to do. and. I know the previous board members had an opportunity to talk to Tracy Richter, who was our um, visioning consultant. You guys had a one-on-one -on -one with him to talk through what you guys thought about. And I want to afford that same opportunity to Isaac and, and Darby to have that conversation so we can get their thoughts on it as well. So um, we'll definitely get Tracy back in the mix for the board members and also 
um, as part of this process, we'll, we'll have to go through a couple more visioning and sort of relook at once we get some options and how that looks. So there'll be a lot more of that to, to come with a lot more community engagement. With the entire that. board too. Oh, Sorry. without yeah. a doubt, yes, yes. And our community. So um, I'll just skip over that because that's a, a lot of um, things that we don't, we'll have to re-engage again anyway. Um, but if you want, or we can wait till the next one. I, I have all the options um, here. We can go through each option, give you a brief overview of them so you get an idea of what they are. So you can take it back and digest it and bring back questions for later. Or we can wait and just do this at one session. I think it might be more helpful to do it one session. What does the board think? Yeah. I would agree with that. Darby, what do you think? Darby? I really have no opinion on that. I think whatever okay. you all feel it would, would work. Julie? Uh, I think it would be helpful to have the overview so that people could digest it, but it, I'm whatever the will of the board. Too much information at this point. I think. Uh... I just is like, <laughs> no, please don't make me overload. <laughs> Anyway. We, we may be fire hosing our new board member. So how about if we save that for one session and just. We have a committee meeting together. coming up the first Monday next month. Right? I was going to say it's coming up pretty quickly. So. Okay. So. That'd be great. I'll Let's plan on that then. Then. Okay. <laughs> Julie, that's okay. Darby. Yes, sir. All right. Go ahead, Chris. All right. So if we're going to skip the options tonight, the. Um, just some things to think about uh, going forward after we get the options. We'll, we'll, we still have a lot of discussion left on um, as we go through the uh, as we go through the options. There'll be things to consider from operational savings that we need to talk about. Um, again, OCC participation, yes or no, we'll need to talk about. Um, we'll take a look at a current bond debt service and look at that, how that impacts us financially. We be part of that, and. Um, you know, we'll need a deeper, broader discussion with some of our specialty spaces. We've never really dove into our athletic, band, theater, um, those types of spaces and what our community would like or need in those areas. So that will be something that we'll need to bring back and discuss. And also really explore more business and community partnerships. What's out there uh, to, to look at as far as the business and community uh, partnership in some of these projects that we may or may not do in the future. So um, just some things to think about, but if we're not going to do the options tonight, that's all I have. So, but I think those are all great points. I'd love to hear those. Mm -hmm. Great. So, when we do at the next meeting dive into the options, you will do the cost associated with the options. Yes, yeah. we, we do. We do have a, we have a general that, right? baseline cost of what the option would cost. Um, but we have not looked at you know some of these options would decommission buildings and not bring back buildings. So. Those would be operational savings that we need to take a deeper dive into. So we need to take a whole look at the entire picture when we're looking at the plan, not just the cost for facilities, but how does it impact operational costs? How does it impact our PI budget going forward? Those types of things for. as well. And I think it's important, even though she's here, important <laughs> to have Jenny in the room during the financial oh, piece. Yeah. You mean Jenny yeah. in the yeah. chair would be great. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Here instead of Jenny on the block. Jenny on the computer yeah yeah she she definitely needs to be part of that conversation for sure definitely but that's the cliff notes version for now is is that it chris for the night unless you have other things you want to talk about okay all right that was a lot to absorb for everyone questions thoughts further information that you feel like you might need to have in order to uh, yeah, especially if you go forward. through this, take a deep dive in for our next meeting. If you get those questions to me, I can hopefully get some data to you or, or be prepared and hopefully answer some questions for you. You know, if I get them at the meeting, I might be able to answer them, but um, I may have to wait till I can research or whatever you may need. So as soon as you can get the uh, information of questions or concerns you may have, I can reach back with our team here and get that. Did I miss anything? I'm sorry, gentlemen. Did and our committee meetings are the first Monday at 6 30. Correct. At 6 30. And those are public meetings. Mm -hmm. So our community is welcome to attend and watch that process and um, weigh in in public comment or send us emails about what you're hearing and what you're thinking. We about have what public you're comments at community meetings. 
We won't have public comment there, yeah. but they certainly can talk in board meetings or send yeah, us emails. I just want to make sure that it's a listening. It is. It is listening only. It's not. It's one of our meetings that is not participatory. <coughs> it is just, um, yeah. just there to, only. to watch us uh, yeah. work through this process. And, and, and part of our discussions too will be how do we engage the community? Have, you know, I know we've talked a lot with Betsy with thought exchange and public meetings and mm -hmm. uh, participation meetings where they can come and actually participate. So the public will have ample opportunity to come and, and talk through any options or anything that we have. So we look forward to those as well. And we were, we've been talking about community engagement and community conversations and some wide open forums where people can oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, weigh in and let us know their opinion on what the work that we're doing. There won't be any votes taken until that work's been done right. and the community has the opportunity to be a part of it. So. Oh yeah, if you, if you look at the planning process, you know, you get all your community input before the board votes on anything. Right, so right. That's a vital part of the process. One of the most expensive things will do so. Are there anything anyone can think of that they want to ask Chris or ask for for the next meeting at this point? No, but thank you for your presentation. Yeah, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for the time. You got through well a done. tremendous amount of information. I really appreciate it. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us as well. We will move on to public comment. Uh, Mrs. Foley is bringing that document forward. And again, you are welcome to just say your name and give your address to Mr. Miller if you would prefer not to say that out loud. We are going to take a three minute recess. Yes. So we'll be right back in three minutes, which will be, you know, one. I'm doing this.
Yes, please. We'll return from recess. Not that it was turned on. <laughs> <laughs> that was not my teacher voice. <laughs> yeah, my yeah, mommy's my voice. <laughs> All right. As a reminder, if you have not, or if you are not stating your address publicly, please share it with Mr. Miller in writing. And we will start with Mrs. Amy Reg Hurmer. I'm sorry if I did not pronounce that correctly. And Jessica Williams will follow. Um, I'm Amy Ragurahman. Um, so at the last board meeting, it was mentioned that- Sorry, I just one moment. Can you fix the mic, somebody for her? Close that. Sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. You guys able to hear me? Okay. Um, so I'm Thank Amy Ragurahman. Um, at the last board meeting, it was mentioned that a few members would be attending a training about the backpack bill, otherwise known as House Bill 290. So after looking into this bill, I'm here to ask the Lakota School Board to issue a resolution or statement condemning this bill. Uh, this bill would take money away from public schools by issuing a voucher to any student who wants to attend a private school of their choosing. Uh, this has no cap on any family income level or geographical relation to the school in question. To me, this violates Article 6, Section 2 of the Ohio Constitution, which states that the General Assembly shall provide a thorough and efficient system of common schools. Um, having separate public and private school funding creates two different systems that to me are not equal. Um, unfortunately, many private schools do not have to abide by the same standards as public schools. For example, abiding by any ADA requirements or accepting students who don't follow our particular religious ideology. Um, and in this in this Cincinnati area, there's there tends to be the private schools tend to be more parochial. So to me, there needs to also be a separation of church and state. Um, while families are free to practice any religion of their choice, we should not be using public state tax dollars to fund these parochial schools. I'm also concerned uh, about the regulation about some of these schools that our tax dollars <laughs> might be funding with this voucher program. Um, for example, um, ECOT has cost, the, has cost the state around $60 million by not regulating if kids are attending class. And schools like Bishop Sycamore made national news not last year when their football program was featured on ESPN, but then it was found that none of these schools are ever attended classes and there's investigations on this. So, as a proud Lakota East graduate who attended K through 12 in Lakota, I am fearful that Lakota will not be able to continue providing the same high quality of education if more and more resources are lost due to this universal voucher program. Uh, with Lakota being among one of the largest public schools in the state of Ohio, I feel that um, the board should be advocating for the, the education of all Lakota students as a public institution. So once again, um, I am asking the Lakota School Board to please condemn the backpack bill other known as House Bill 290. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Williams is up and Kara Whitesell will follow. Then we have zero teacher training on how to hand stuff up. Thank you, we appreciate it. We appreciate that. Thank you. Mr. Miller, do it for you. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, yes, my name is Jessica Williams, and I gave Mr. Miller my address. Um, my husband has trained me well. He does work for the government. So I'm just going to start with the bottom line up front. I'm just asking you guys to do something. We all know the numbers are going up for COVID. We all know that the community numbers are going up as well. And we know that there are three things that can help this. We've been taught this in the last two years over and over again, masking, distancing, and ventilation. Yesterday, last year, you guys did a lot of masking and distancing, which was amazing. Um, I had one in school and one at home doing virtual. This year, I have still one at home doing virtual and two in school. I'm an engineer and I like data. 
I have compared the last two years of the school year with the Butler County data. We can argue over what it says, if anything. But the one thing I think we can all agree upon is that the numbers are high, very high. Last year's data compared to this year's, we had full masking all of last year and it barely moved off of the Butler County numbers. This year, we are jumping. We are twice, two and a half times of what Butler County is seeing. I've given that to you in a couple of different forms, just so you can see it. I, un I just don't understand why we were willing to do something when the numbers were low and not willing to do anything now. I'm here to ask, beg you to do something. We just got another close contact call today. Lunch call. We all know what that means. It means it's most likely my kid is positive. So there are three things we could do. We could do masking. Lebanon has gone back to masking. They had more people against masking than we did when this all started this year. And they have reinstated masking. We could do distancing. However, missing teachers and full classrooms, my kid is telling me that's probably not gonna be possible. And we could do ventilation. And I heard you guys mention that earlier, that there is more you know, airflow in the buildings, which is great, but it's obviously not preventing this. It's not helping. So I'm just begging you, humbly asking, begging, I don't know, to do something. I've asked about air filters in classrooms. I've asked about HEPA filters. I know we can't put them on the whole building, but we could put them in the classroom. Please, I can't keep watching these numbers go up and not do something. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Waitzell, and thank you for the information. Folks, I'm going to ask that we not do applause tonight on either side of the coin, just because we need to continue getting through our business. We'd appreciate it. Um, Mrs. Whitesell is up and Kate Redestidge is up next. Hi, Kara Whitesell. Nice to see you, Lynn and Matt. <laughs> um, I'm here for the first time. I don't have anything prepared. I was just really coming to share my thoughts um, because I do have a kindergartner first time in Lakota schools. And be, I'm in favor of what the previous speaker has said, uh, mostly because coming from preschool um, in the peak of COVID, where it was mask mandated and temperatures taken, we had no COVID at the preschool. We had no flu at the preschool. We had no strep at the preschool. We had no hand, foot, and mouth at the preschool. So case in point is that the masks do something. And the fact that we're not mandating it, my kid is one of three children that I see in his 27 attended classroom that wear masks. And so for a five-year-old who's instructed and asked to wear a mask all day, sees the majority of his peers not wearing one, it primarily ends up under his chin for most of the day. And then I have to beg the kindergarten teacher to remind my one student of 27 to pull his mask up, which I know is a humongous ask given that the task that she has just teaching 27 five-year-olds. Um, my ask would be to mandate the mask. Um, of course, special circumstances for special needs, whatever the case, but the majority mask mandate I would ask to take some extra time to take temps um, before kids get on bus or at drop-off car ride. It's a very simple scan the wrist, scan the head, whatever. You got a temperature, you go home. You don't get on the bus. Um, and uh, a couple extra hand washings would be nice. Um, I'm sure there's some time in the day that they're doing extracurricular nothings so that they could be at a hand washing station. And I've asked my five-year-old, do you guys wash your hands when you come in from playground? He says, no. And I say, well, you tell your teacher that your mom says you have to wash your hands when you come in and before you eat any snack or food. And so unfortunately um, I have a very wise five-year-old that will do just that thing and tell her, but 
Um, if it's not a common practice, I don't know how helpful it is when he and 26 other kids are all touching the same things throughout the day. So um, that's just my ask. I've put it in email. Um, I understand the pushback from non-maskers. And um, at this point, it's just got me reconsidering uh, private school, perhaps, or places that will mandate a mask. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mrs. Whitesell. Kate Redestage is up and Mr. Alex Argo will be next. Uh, hello, um, I had wanted to express concern uh, about uh, the backpack bill that was brought up at the last meeting. Um, I am very confused as to why any of our Lakota local district board members would be advocating for a bill that would take money away from our district and promote people to leave the Lakota school district. Uh, as Lakota board members, which are not beholden to the state of Ohio or even Butler County, you are supposed to be serving the students, staff and families of the Lakota district. Uh, this would be like Amazon's board telling everyone to stop using their products and services and go use General Electric's instead. Why? Um, this bill would put a massive hurt onto families on IEPs in the district and special needs families. Our family is incredibly grateful and reliant on the services that are provided by the state and IEP program facilitated by the district. I would really, really hate to think what would happen to these programs if their resources were stripped. Uh, I would like to ask the members of the board what their stances on special education would be because some members support of this bill is, or is in direct conflict with the support for special needs services and the services for the students in the district as a whole. Uh, and there is a, a member of the board's campaign website had said that, you know, if they were elected to the school board, they would focus their desire to serve in working with the superintendent and teachers to provide the children an exceptional education. Their goal is to help make the district school system become one of the top 20 best academic districts in Ohio. And that was a quote. Um, I don't see how this bill that was vocally supported at our last meeting would do that. Our funds need to be better used to support our teachers, their salaries, substitutes, provide them with a safe learning environment, including physical and mental health support. Um, we do offer mental health support to the students, but I'm curious, does anyone know if we offer mental health support to our educators and staff? Uh, these have been some of the hardest years that our school staff have faced for some in their entire careers. Every teacher friend that I personally know, I have about 15, uh, are exhausted and strained and just need help and to know that their community cares about them instead of attacking them and vilifying them for doing their job. Um, in regards to removing quarantine policies, our leading medical experts, by and large, as well as the Ohio Department of Health, have placed the measures we have in place for the health and safety of our students, have they not? They have consulted with the leading health experts, virologists, immunologists, contagion specialists. These people have spent decades of their lives to be able to educate us on what the best practices are in a pandemic. Why would we fly in the face of those people who are clearly more educated than any school administration's expertise in the field of health and reject their recommendations to keep our staff and students safe? Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Brennestage. Mr. Argo is up and Jedediah Plasted is up next. Uh, my name is Alex Argo, uh, 6335 Coach Ass Way. Uh, as always, thanks for uh, what, giving us some time to speak. Uh, real quick, I just wanted to uh, thank Mr. Miller for uh, coming out, or we're not coming out, but uh, recording the video for uh, Heritage Early Childhood School. Um, uh, with with Biggs uh, reading uh, where the wild things are, the my daughter came home from school today and was told me that uh, we got to see uh, Biggs and some guy uh, read us a book. So <laughs> we really enjoyed that. Um, but mo moving on, um, so I, I know that uh, one thing that every single member on the board thinks is important is fiscal responsibility. You know, one of the four pillars of the previous board's vision was, in fact, we are fiscally responsible. Uh, House Bill 290, the defund public education bill, as I like to call it, would, <laughs> would take much needed funds away from our schools and make it harder to accurately predict the needs for our master facilities plan, which we just talked about. 
Could this bill cause Lakota to need an operating levy in the, if it passes? Would it cause our individual or business state taxes to go up to pay for the current private and homeschool students? Who knows? The only estimates that I have seen have put a cost at hundreds of millions to billions of dollars on this. I think this is an important issue that deserves to have a stance taken by the board. Um, at our last meeting, as others have mentioned, uh, it was brought up by Mrs. Logan and there is not any discussion other than the mention of an Empower You seminar. And I hope others talked about that training because it started off, I, I watched the training, it started off with a raffle uh, of a book of conspiracy theories and kind of went downhill very quickly from there. Um, but there is no other comment other than that. Uh, I emailed the board and provided a sample resolution uh, that condemned House Bill 290 that another school board had recently passed and asked the board to take a stand. And the response I received from the board was, quote, the board has not taken a stance regarding House Bill 290, end quote. I'm aware that's why I emailed. Um, so here I am today again, asking this time in public, will the board please take a stance on this bill that is clearly bad for Lakota, bad for our children and bad for our taxpayers. To be clear, there's nothing wrong with homeschooling or private schools if that's what works for your child. Ohio already expanded their voucher program last year and is ranked fifth in the country, as I learned from that uh, training for school choice without this proposed law. Lakota's taxpayers, schools and children should not have to bear the burden if an individual chooses a private school, however. And I hope that the board will take a strong stance against House Bill 290. The stance seems like it should be a very simple stance for the board of elections of a public school board to take. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Argo. Mr. Jetta Diaplastid is up and Mrs. Wheatley will follow him. Uh, Jetta Diaplastid, um, 8004 Tulip Tree Circle. Um, so at the last meeting, Mrs. Logan asked the board if they would like to make a statement to the Ohio legislature about HB 290, the defund the public education bill, otherwise known as the backpack bill. At the time, Mrs. Body said she was attending an informational meeting about the defunding public education bill. She said the informational meeting was being sponsored by Empower You. I had the chance to go to their website and watch the presentation that Mrs. Body and Mr. A uh, Adai and possibly Mrs. O'Connor attend. It was unclear um, if Mrs. O'Connor was there in person based on how the speaker made introductions. It was obvious that this was a very biased, one-sided view of the bill. My question is, will the board also avail themselves to additional information sessions in order to be well-informed about the issues associated with HB 290? And will the board take action by writing a letter to the Ohio legislature expressing their opposition to HB 290, assuring the parents of students in the Lakota School District that they will fight to keep the funding right here in the school district. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Plastid. Mrs. Wheatley is up and Dresden Souls Peters would be up next. Sandy Wheatley, 8729 Monticello Drive. <clears throat> I'm rather appalled by the grandstanding I saw this evening when a five page resolution was presented to the board with no previous um, presentation of that resolution before or prior to this. The last two years we've heard nothing but transparency, 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 and the fact that the previous board had none and this new board would have some. <clears throat> and now the board was being asked to vote on a resolution they just saw, and more importantly, a resolution that the community has never seen. <clears throat> so much for transparency, I guess. I wanna thank the rest of the board for voting no on going forward with this resolution. I appreciate that. And I am asking the board to have this resolution posted publicly and that you have two board meetings for public comment by the community before any vote is taken on the resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Wheatley. 
Mrs. Peters is up and Heather Cameron will be up next. President Souls Peters, uh, thank you so much for allowing the public time to comment. I greatly appreciate the vocal support from the board in the past about the desireness and willingness to hear from the community. I know that the meetings are available via Zoom for members of our community who are unable to attend in person for various reasons. I myself have attended via Zoom in the past. In the past, it was possible for Zoom attendees to comment. I'm curious as to why that is no longer allowed and if it's possible to allow comments from Zoom attendees in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Peters. Mrs. Cameron is up and Douglas Horton will be up after that. Heather Cameron, 6440 Anderson Drive, Liberty Township, 45044. Hello, I am very concerned that several board members attended a hyperpartisan event supporting the backpack bill. This bill would be a violation of the legislature's responsibility under the Ohio Constitution to fund a system of common public schools. Ohio students do not lack for school choice with five existing voucher programs. Most importantly, this bill will negatively impact the public school system and the children with disabilities in our district. I was under the impression that one would be a school board member because they were passionate about educating all of our students, not causing harm to the public school system. Children with disabilities have the right to a free and appropriate public education. Private for-profit institutions can refuse students with disabilities and do not have to follow IEPs due to them being a federally instituted program. When schools lose funding while still accommodating demands, the district and its property values will decline. Where do you stand on House Bill 290 as a school board? I would also like to know what process you have for making a new policy. Can the policy committee establish a new policy at the committee level? Does the board have to vote on any new policies? Will the community have the opportunity to weigh in on any policy proposals? Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Cameron. Mr. Horton is up. Mr. Benjamin McCall will be up next. Uh, good evening, Douglas Horton, 8207 Paddington Court, Westchester, Ohio. In March of 2021, the Ohio Department of Education released its plan to improve learning experiences and outcomes for students with disabilities, which it entitled Each Child Means Each Child. This plan offers recommendations, tactics, and action steps to ensure students currently enrolled in public schools who have been identified with disabilities benefit from the vision and core principles heralded in Ohio's strategic plan for education. This plan also uses empirical data to illustrate what education looks like for Ohio students with disabilities. I and many in this community are interested to hear how the quoted school district fares against the three major focus areas recommended by this plan. One, getting to the problem early with a multi-tiered system of support. Two, building educators in system-wide capacity. And three, educating for living a good life with post-secondary readiness and planning. As a board who has, who has expressed interest in improving educational experiences for all of our students, I request the following assistance from you. One, request of the current administration to provide a formal assessment of the district's plan to implement the recommendations within each child means each child plan. Two, regular updates within these meetings on the district's improvement in learning experiences and outcomes for the students of the district with disabilities. And three, if needed, carefully crafted interventions and support to accelerate the improvement in these learning experiences and outcomes. I and many families of this district thank you in advance for your support of our students. Thank you, Mr. Horton. Mr. McCall is up and Jill Jonathan is up after that. 
Uh, good evening, Benjamin McCall, 6758 Gray Birch Knoll. Just want to cover three points. There's so much to discuss, but all these points are based off spirit and respect and feedback. Uh, communication, it's important. We all agree. We all understand that. Being respectful and understanding key traits to support this uh, and these points. Other keys are being informed. And to be informed, it's important to listen. In the last board meeting, there was uh, evidence of the challenge in communication. Like for example, the superintendent during his administrative report outlined a number of actions that the school and the administration were working on and addressing within the schools. And within five minutes, there were questions from Ms. Bodie and Ms. O'Connor uh, that he had just addressed literally three or four minutes before. Um, there were questions and there were multiple times that this happened uh, with many people. But for any of us attending a meeting, and being in a meeting, repeating yourself can be unsettling. Uh, imagine being a member of the community watching this. And I just ask that there's a stronger effort to intently listen to each other uh, because not being informed and not listening will create more issues for not only your communication, but also in turn cr create communication issues for and amongst the community. The second point I address is uh, COVID related. Health and safety is not just the job of parents. Uh, it is also the role as we have seen the school administration, the public, and also the state health department. I agree with managing decisions for my child and my family, but I also feel it's important to allow the school administration, health department, and other bodies that we elect and we put into place to address those holistically within the community. Here's the thing, for those that say, it shouldn't be the job of the health department to regulate and, and guide health, then why do we have a health department? It shouldn't be the job of educators to have strict guidelines or outlines on education, have plans within school and administration, now, why do we have school administration and teachers? Uh, this all shows that we care for one another and that we allow people to do their roles that we've appointed them to do. And if the Sheriff Butler County can admit that there's an issue and that public should do their part and wear masks, well, I think we can do too, uh, as evidenced by many of the people in this room. And finally, a budget point. As we just addressed within the master plan and in other budget meetings, the district is growing. And in order for Lakota to address this, to sustain it and to support it, this growth without funds, uh, we'll have a, a problem. It's just not heartening to see that any parent or board member potentially support a bill, backpack bill that will move money out of the district, especially when you may not, do not, or choose not have to have children in the district. In summary, we all have our choices. Uh, however, I think that when we make any choice that we should not only think about how it affects us personally and, and uh, selfishly, but also how it impacts others around us holistically, because we're not just in our neighborhoods and we're not just in our homes. We go out into the public, we go out into the streets, we go out into highways. And we have regulation and governing bodies to be able to help that. We also want to respect each other when we're doing that. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. McCall. This is Johansson, Jonathan. My name is Jill Jonathan, and I'm a parent of a seventh and fourth grader. My children have been in the Lakota School District since they started kindergarten, and we've had a very positive experience. I think we can all agree that living through a pandemic is challenging, and if this pandemic has taught us anything, that we don't know for sure what the future holds. That's why I'm thankful to this administration for following guidance from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention the Ohio Department of Health and other health experts, and for communicating to our district that we all need to be flexible as policies can change. I'm grateful that Lakota decided to offer an online option again this year for families that felt more comfortable keeping their children home. And I can imagine the online is a better option for some students. So thank you for recognizing that. I have found that my children do better in person and I would like to see the school stay open, but not at the cost of someone's health. So I encourage you to continue following the guidelines and making decisions based on the overall health and safety of the faculty and students. I'm dedicated to being an active parent in the school community, and I'd like to partner with the new board as we continue to navigate educating our students in a pandemic and supporting all students. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Jonathan.
That was our last speaker. Was there anyone else? Mrs. Carter? I'm sorry, you're right. It kind of ran together with somebody else's squiggle. <laughs> Please come forward. Thank you. That's okay. Please come forward. The squiggle threw me off. Yeah. So this is, oh, my name is Penny Greenler. This is in reference to the backpack bill. My three children graduated from Lakota East. My oldest was a Marine pilot flying C-130s, four tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, and now flies to the Air National Guard, who also put out the fires in California. He took all the math classes he needed to make it possible for him to become a pilot. Why could he do this? Because there was no backpack bill and the, uh, stealing money from public schools. My middle child took every art class in public high school and is a very successful graphic artist. Why could he do that? Because there was no backpack bill stealing money from public schools. My youngest took AP classes at Lakota, graduated from college with honors, became a research intern at the NIH, then a research coordinator at Children's Hospital. Why could she do that? Because there was no backpack bill stealing money from the public schools. I taught 29 years in public elementary schools in the poorest of schools in Ohio. The backpack money steals money from the poorest schools as well. Public schools serve all children. Public schools do not choose the students they teach and they teach them all regardless of language, religion or income level. The backpack bill steals money for advanced classes, enrichment, remediation, counselors, interventions, <laughs> educational testing, reading specialists, English language learners, steals money from all children. The backpack bill is, excuse me, should not be supporting private commercial educational enterprises. The backpack bill is basically designed to destroy public schools. No one who serves on a public school board should be advocating to remove money for funding for a public school. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Greenland. Is there anyone else? All right, I'll attempt to respond to some of these and ask Mr. Miller to also assist and other board members as they feel they want to. Mrs. Reg Hermer, and I am so sorry for massacring that name, uh, discussed the fact that uh, three board members attended training offered by Empower You for House Bill 290 and called for a resolution condemning that brought up the issue of the regulation of schools uh, being different for private and online schools versus public schools. Mrs. Williams talked about uh, data that she had collated on Lakota and Butler County expressed a concern with the rise in numbers. Mrs. Whitesell talked about masking for preschool students and cited uh, that very small number of one to three kids are wearing masks in schools in their child's classroom. Mrs. Bredestage was confused by board support possibly for House Bill 90, also talked about quarantine protocols. Mr. Argo talked about, actually this might have been my, first, my favorite one, talking about bigs and wild things kind of went together in a, in a nice way. And some guy that was reading that story uh, also talked about fiscal responsibility, the point with the backpack bill. And I will come back to the backpack bill in a moment. Jedediah Plasted also talked about um, if the board would take a stand on the backpack bill and will the board avail themselves of other training? I'll come back to that as well. Mrs. Wheatley referenced the resolution at the front of our meeting and asked that there be a pause before a vote was taken on that. Mrs. Peters talked about a question that I think we're in the middle of researching, which is about um, participation for Zoom attendees as opposed to just observation. Mrs. Cameron raised a question about the process for policy and House Bill 290 as well, and how does policy get changed? Mr. Horton discussed uh, a piece passed in 2021, March, for a plan for students with disabilities, and if we would give an updated report on where we are in those. 
and how we might go about improving the outcomes on that. Mr. McCall talked about listening and communication and considering the impact on others of our actions. Mrs. Jonathan talked about guidelines for health and safety and asked for us to consider those and also was appreciative of the fact that we offer the VLO option. And Mrs. Greenlee talked about House Bill 290 and how well her children had done as a result of a public school setting. So I'll go in reverse order actually. Mrs. Greenlee, please thank your son for his service and so thankful that he received an education that really helped him meet his goals and your other children as well, but please thank him for his service. We did attend, and I will let my fellow board members speak on this themselves, but I did attend a, a training on Hospital 290 that was by Empower You, and I've attended many, many trainings on House Bill 290. And I will always, in answer the to the question about will we attend alternate alternative thoughts and points of view, and I already have done that, we'll continue to do that on all the issues that come in front of us because it's really important to weigh all sides of it before you make any determinations. And I will tell you that at that particular meeting, I observed the, the process and observed our speaker and immediately afterwards approached him with a number of concerns that I had about that legislation. So you can have a great concept that you believe in. I believe Dakota should be a district of choice and strives to be a district of choice as a public school. You can have a great idea which is that we offer our families alternatives for education that best suit their, their children. And I agree with that, but a great idea doesn't always result in the best legislation. So at that uh, event, I actually took time to address some questions and concerns that I had with the hope that improvement could be made to the legislation. Um, I will uh, let Mr. Adi say anything he would like to about that since it was raised by several people tonight. Yes, um, on that, I was there as well. Um, it's good to be educated. You need to go and hear more about issues. Uh, and, and to conclude that because you attended, you, read up, you, you already made up your mind, you are in favor of the bill, it's your personal opinion. I've not told anybody what my opinion is regarding that, but it's, it's good to, to, to go out and hear more about issues and that help you to make the right decision when you want to make your decisions. Thank you. This was Billy. And I also attended. Um, so there are there are valid concerns that you guys uh, have brought up before us, and I think those are things to definitely consider. However, I will say that um, you, with some of the information that they gave us, there is a decreasing <laughs> academic and um, performance and spiritual malice proven from our children. And a good education leads to hope and meaningful purpose for our students. And I would think that we would want that for our students. Um, and the, the, the funds go to the community, charter, private, homeschool. They're used for educational or summer camps or tutoring. And there was a parent that spoke that said she would like to take her child to private school. And that would be great if she could have the funds to afford the private school with a backpack bill. Um, also leftover money rolls over. Half of, half of the money rolls over and it can be used for college savings, which would be great. Um, and then, you know, the benefits, there's parents satisfactory more than doubles with the child's education. Um, the child is proven to obtain a higher level later on in school. Um, there's great efficiency in school market. And when choosing a school, kids' academic performance is better than a high quality teacher. Um, so parents, I feel it comes down to freedoms and parents should have the freedom to choose what is best for their child. And I think as Lakota, we want the child to come to our school and that is our goal. And we want to be in the top um, schools in, in the state. But if we are not, and we have multiple children leaving our school, what are we doing wrong? And we need to take a serious look at um, what we are doing in our school system that is making our children leave. So again, it comes to personal freedoms. And I believe that we should have the freedom to choose what type of education benefits our child the most. You weren't at the meeting, but would you like to comment? Sure, because I did watch it actually. There you go. After the fact. Um, I think we all agree that we want our parents do have the right to choose what education they want for their students, but not at the expense of defunding the public education. 
when you say that you want to take a look, you should take a look at why our children are leaving Lakota. Well, it doesn't appear based on Mr. Passage's numbers that our children are leaving Lakota. So I personally am not in support of the backpack bill, but I have like Mrs. O'Connor, because it is our job as school board members to get all of the information, information. we possibly can before making a decision. Yeah. I mean, that's why we are, that's what we are charged to do. Mm -hmm. So I think that, I mean, I did not attend, but I did watch. That. I think that was virtual attendance. So thank you for yeah. weighing in. Yeah, uh, and I agree with you. And, you know, in our legislative work, it's very important that we try to see all sides of the issues before we advocate in any direction. It's also our job to go to those kind of meetings and say, so here's where this legislation, this proposed legislation impacts us on the ground. And here's the here's the outcome of that or possible outcome. Um, Mrs. Schaefer, would you like to weigh in on that as well? I too listen to the program online and I just, think that we have to be very careful because I feel like our role is to advocate and make sure we make our public schools as strong as they can be mm -hmm. um, and not advocate for how people can leave Lakota. Um, I would also suggest that perhaps Mrs. Logan did say she was gonna be getting some more information on the backpack, backpack bill. So perhaps she can bring some more information uh, from her perspective and maybe a recommendation to us at the next board meeting as well. And I would also question again, some of those statistics that spoke about success of those who have left our doors versus stayed in our doors, um, because I've seen some different data that contradicts some of the things that were quoted. Thank you. So it would appear that all five board members were in attendance either virtually or in person. And you know, I'm thankful to my fellow board members for seeking professional development on different topics, especially on upcoming legislation. So thank you for that. Mr. Miller, are there things you would like to weigh in on? Sorry if I stole your thunder. Okay. Okay. You gotta speak in your mind. That rarely happens. Um, <laughs> No, if you could just share with me, you mentioned you quoted some things. I'd love to take a look at that data. I'm not going to attend that. I don't have the time, quite honestly. And that's what I lean on all four. I think or we're five well, well represented, so, so it's okay. All right. But so perhaps um, you could share that with the entire board. That is the data that they, the information that they gave us. I Can you give it to me? I'm, I mean, you can go to Empower You, I think, and watch the video. Well, part of your job as a board member when we attend professional development is to share what you found yeah. with the rest of the board. That's exactly what I shared. <laughs> we could have it in writing on board docs as I personally If can. we're all going off the same data, it would be more helpful to us. So that that's my so how, that's my So give me an example of how you're wanting me to share it because I just um, share whatever it. the notes were that you quoted there. Okay. If you could just put them in writing and share them out. Do so you want it in writing personally sent to each person? No, you can do it as a board document. That would be fine. Doc. I'm sorry, I was just asking, because you, you mentioned some, you quoted something, you said they gave it to you. I just want to see it and want to check it out myself. That's all. No, that's fine. I don't understand exactly what you're asking and how, what that looks like. We'll talk offline. Okay, thank you. And then yeah. my, my only other thing, it's, it's kind of a repeat in terms of people leaving Lakota. I'm, I'm okay with school choice, school choice. I think you have to do it the right way. But to Mr. Passage's point, we have 500 more students, almost a whole building than what, what we were planning for. Um, so I don't see... Uh, um, uh, a lot of people leaving. I'm just proud of our teachers and proud of our school. And I, just, I know you are too, but I'm just pointing that out. Thank you, Matt. Yep. Um, there was a question by Mrs. Bredestedge about mental health support for educators and staff and if we're offering that. And she did note that we are offering that for our students. Could you clarify that? We, we do for our, for our students, but I think she was more asking for our staff if I had that right. Um, that, that was the question. And so we would have... We don't have a great program, quite honestly, for that. That's one of my concerns because I know that this is taking a toll on educators and staff. So we do have EAP services. We did, when we went um, remote, we had some teachers that had some issues that um, we were able to have them slotted in the VLO. Not all of them, but some of them because they were more comfortable because of their health conditions or whatever. So I don't have a great answer for that yet, but it's one of those things that I'm looking for. A and quite, on it, and quite honestly... Our administrators and principals. I, I 
think that sometimes they get caught in the crossfire between central office and the building level. And so um, I don't think we are at any more at a work-life balance. I think we've all, all of us probably in this room have gone to a work-life blend and sometimes that's not good. True. So we are, we recognize it. We are looking for solutions. I just don't have one yet, yet. And we have had a staff, a long established staff um, health and wellness committee mm -hmm. we that meets and deals with these kind of issues. So I would think there's been some internal discussion around that as well. Yep. Okay. Thank you all for the public comments. We very much appreciate that and, uh, and appreciate having our community here with us and talking to us on a regular basis. We've also received quite a few board emails and I'll be responding to those. Um, Sorry that uh, it takes a little longer sometimes for that to happen. Can I mention too, real quick, if you don't mm -hmm. mind, uh, just Mr. Horton's comments. So I will, I will get on that and get some more information about that. So thank you for bringing that up. I think that was one of the ones that was only mentioned right. once. So ask for the students with disabilities plan and an update yep. on that. Yep. All right. I, I have something to respond to. Go ahead. Um, so. First of all, I would want to I want to kind of throw out there who are we to decide what is best for our students. I mean, we have different medical needs in the community. So why are we relying on the schools to implement these, um, you know, medically medical devices on faces that are only. But the thing is, some of these are not proven, proven, sorry, proven that maybe for your data, but that my argument is we want to make sure that we're looking at all the data. And so far, we've only been going by one side of data. We have not been going by the other side. And like I said previously, there is multiple. I'd ask us to, to be respectful, please. Well, there's data on one side that says this, whereas there's data on another side that says this. Like, Masking children, tragic, unscientific, and damaging. Death by mask, lessons learned in 1918. So again, there's data on both sides, but you, but I feel like we wanna make sure that we are open to all forms of data to make the best decisions for our um, children and what is um, best for them. And the other thing that I wanted to address was that um, we did, say that we were going to address these masks in this, this quarantine conversation in the um, February 4th meeting. But then I did learn that the policy is to go through three different reads and then to approve it. So therefore I'm not willing to risk the health of our students and of our, and our, our, um, our staff and continue furthering the, the, the um, mask, the, the mandates and the quarantine. I think with the data that I have, I'm very concerned for the health of our um, of our students and of our staff. And I feel like waiting another three reads to make a decision on something is potentially harming and hurting our students. And so that is my concern. And that is why I brought this up. Now, I understand not feeling comfortable with um, the timeline. I understand that. So therefore, in two weeks, would you guys be, be, be prepared to, I make another motion and you pre be prepared to vote on that motion in two weeks? Is that enough time? Mrs. Bodie, the policy committee will meet and come forward with a draft for first read. At the next regular board meeting is the second read and the vote on it. So it's not three reads. So I'm not sure where that information came from, but it's not three reads. Do we not have to have a read and then a second read and then a third read for a policy. There's no passed. third read. It's a first read after the policy committee meets, which means February 4th would be the first policy committee meeting where this could be discussed. The meeting right after that would be February 10th and the first read could be on the agenda for that meeting. So we vote following the process that we've talked about, I think helps the board to have more credibility in their processes. But the thing and is, we've, we've asked for it yeah. to go through this process because there are many, many issues involved in changing, the, including potential liability, yeah. legal liability for the district. So if we could stick to the process, I, as one board member, would appreciate that. 
I am not willing to make our children um, continue to stay masked and quarantined for three additional more weeks. I don't think that this have a, I think that's the way that that is the system, that is a procedure. And I don't, I personally am not willing to change that. I'm willing to follow the way that it is in our policy and our. Mr. D. I don't have anything to say on it, ma'am. I don't have anything to say on that, ma'am. As a board member, you are always welcome to bring a res resolution forward. That is always your right. If it's a collaborative process, it's probably more likely for your resolution to receive a positive response. I'll leave it there. If you'd like to talk further, I will be happy to walk you through some of the things that I think could help in the process. Anything else? I'm fine for now, thank you. You're welcome. We'll start with you for closing comments, Mrs. Bodie. I think I've all said I've all said everything that I wanted to say this evening. Thank you so much. I'm also fine. I was almost going to put Mr. Passage on the spot, but I won't do that. Because I'm just going to say thank you for your time and for the presentation tonight. And I'm sure we're going to keep you very busy on this. In he had at least an hour more to go. Yeah, at least. <laughs> he did. Uh, he's disappointed. Uh, no, just uh, as always, thanks to our community for coming out. Um, and it was great to see. Um, and I don't want to single out uh, one sport, but I am. But it was nice to see the um, student body at East and West at the East West game. Uh, Friday night and just uh, everything that goes along with that. And when you're talking about everything that, you know, we have to do and the decisions that we have to make, um, when you see all those kids actively engaged in either the sport or in the stands or in the pet bands or dancing or, and I'm not, I'm, I'm going to start leaving people out. So I'll stop there. But um, those are the things that I think keep me going and hopefully keep uh, the rest of us going as well. I'm, can I say something? I know I didn't say I had nothing. Now I do. Really? I know. Really? I just you want a mulligan. <laughs> I, I just I'm very impressed with our student sections in a rivalry game. They I mean, they cheer for their team, but they were not disrespectful at all. It was just nice to see that it was a great game. 99% of it was positive. I know there was a there was a couple of times where the principal had to go in front of the student sections and awesome. glare, but it only takes one glare and they stop. So that's good to hear. I think they're always good ambassadors for us. Um, I'm going to hold on to you for just a minute, Mr. D. And Mrs. Logan, did you have anything? Oh, Julie. Thanks. Um, you know, there were quite a few comments about the backpack bill tonight. Um, I wanted to say I I'm thrilled to see that people in our local community are interested in advocacy on a state level. I, I want to say that. I mean, having worked on a new state funding model for over three years and seeing that, you know, sometimes um, it takes a, a lot of dedication and, and commitment to do that. But I'm just, I'm thrilled to see our community um, interested in it. So um, I know Julie mentioned maybe we'll get more information as we move along and I can bring more uh, forward. But just happy to, to see the interest. Um, and then, yeah, thanks to Chris and his team for all the information and, and more to come. That's it. And we'll look forward to the financial information to go with that, Mrs. Logan. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Mrs. Schaefer. Um, thank you for allowing me to participate via Zoom. I look forward to being out of my um, quarantine as prescribed and being back in the meeting next time. Thank you, Julie. Isaac. Yeah, uh, I want to thank everybody for participating. Um, uh, remembering that we have 17,000 students to take care of. Uh, remember somebody mentioned transparency. We're going to be transparent and we're going to make sure that whatever we do, we're considering the students and the staff. So thank you for coming out. And um, you're also gonna have a voice in everything we do all the time. Thank you so much. I agree with the points that Mr. D made and I think I will leave it there. Thanks everybody for coming out. We have lots of work to do on the facilities plan and we'll look forward to your input on that. Thank you, have a good evening, we're adjourned. Gonna make a motion.